testing, testing. This is the English translation. Can you hear the English translation? Are you connected? Ecco. There we are. I know that there are still people outside, but unfortunately we have to start. It is a tradition of the festival to start our meetings punctually at the scheduled time. I have a collection of mails that were sent to Jean Tirol. I mean, you know that we plan our festival and we choose the title uh, of the next edition immediately after the previous one has been concluded and unavoidably we always happen to land on a theme Jean Tirol has been working at. So in June, July, as I have done every single year, I sent my mail to Jean Tirol, informing him that we would have been honored to have him as a speaker at our festival. What happened in the past was that within five, ten minutes, I used to receive a very kind answer by Jean stating, I have heard so much about the festival. I know it is a wonderful initiative. I would like so much to participate. But on that date next year, I have to give a lecture. And it was always a prestigious event, the Econometric Society lecture, for instance, of which Jean has been the president. I have to receive an award at the Académie des Etudes de Morale et Politique in France or the Academy of Arts and Science. And Jean Tirol is one of the few foreign members. So there was always something interfering. But this year, for a series of happy situations, we have been able to have him here with us. And in the meantime, he's even been awarded the Nobel Prize for his studies on market rulings, market regulation in situations characterized by monopolies. So the reason why it is so important for us to have Jean Tirol here with us at the festival resides in the fact that his research work can tell us a lot about what economists do. We tend to think that the economists just make the apology of markets. As a matter of fact, all what Jean Tirol has done has always had the purpose of highlighting the imperfections of the markets. He has documented that markets are imperfect, and that's why he got his Nobel Prize for his studies on the power of monopolies, on market power. But there are many other market imperfections that he has highlighted. And he's going to talk about one of these today. We often hear about externalities. Well, Jean Tirol has focused on internalities. That is, those cases in which people make decisions. Uh, and due to the asymmetry of information, these people are not fully aware of the long-term consequences of such decisions. Therefore, they can self-damage. They can damage themselves. We've been debated the issue of organ transplantation, for instance. But there are many other examples. I don't know whether you have heard about the voluntary APA. This means that a person actually uses the future uh, pension to get a credit immediately. Well, people need to know that, of course, they can receive the money today, but this means that in the future, they will get a smaller pension. So unless there is this awareness, this is an internality, internality issue. Other market imperfections are related to disequality, to lack of attention towards social cohesion issues. There are so many imperfections he has pointed out. And investigating the imperfections of the markets, Jean Tirol has always tried to propose solutions, solutions that can correct the functioning of markets. I mean, when economists are criticized because they go on talking about the markets, 
This is done in very abstract terms. We say that market is not working, let's do away with the market. But, I mean, what can we replace the market with? It is very easy to be appalled by the fact that things do not work properly, but it is much more difficult to investigate the possible changes in terms of incentives and market structures that can actually represent a remedy to the failure. And then there is another methodological lesson that John T. Roll has given us. That is, conceiving the role of the economist as that of a person that shares his or her knowledge, highlighting the pros and cons and the relevant trade-off that accompanies every single decision and choice, rather than trying to sell an idea. In other words, his studies and the reason why his books, like the industrial organizations books, are books that have been studied by generations of economists, well, these books are encyclopedias. You will never find a pamphlet signed by Jean Tirol because he actually presents a problem with a systemic view of the problem, showing all the different facets of the problem. And his last book, The Common Good, is a thick book full of material, full of ideas, full of information, requiring in-depth investigation and studies. But maybe there is an exception, a situation in which Jean Tirol has taken a clear stance. That was the campaign for the French elections, and he was in favor of Macron and against populism. So most likely, you have a very strong vision of the common good in this case. When we invited Jean Tirol to this festival, we asked him to talk about corporate social responsibility, a topic he has been investigated with Bina Booker, who was also our guest some years ago here at the festival. And we chose this topic because talking about disequality in health and the challenges of the national or the different healthcare systems there is the issue of sustainability. Involving the private sector, having companies provided health care services, taking over the social responsibility towards their employees may be something to the advantage of the accounts of the social or welfare state and our national health care systems. So, as you will hear, Jean Tirol uh, has taken on this invitation. I don't want to spoil his presentation, so I'm not going to tell you anything, but he has used this typical approach, which is that of approaching the problem, including all the possible motivations why companies do focus today on CSR. He will talk about philosophy, the relationship between philosophers and economists. So let's listen to his lecture with a lot of attention. I know that you're going to have many, many questions. and. Nevertheless, keep your questions for the end because we will have a Q&A session. Thank you. John, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Tito, for those very kind words. I must say it's very important in those times of populism that people, the wide audience, appropriate economics knowledge um, to fight populism and to understand what the stakes are in economics, like in other, other social sciences. Fifteen years ago, uh, La Voce was created and was very successful, and 12 years ago, this fabulous festival uh, in Trento was, was created as well. And they react for the common good, exactly trying to share with a wide audience actually this knowledge of economics, which is so dear to us. And I think uh, Tito deserves a a round of applause on our side. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Because, of course, it was the same person behind the two. So today, thank you for being here tonight, and uh, I would like to talk a little bit about corporate social responsibility and more reasoning and try to say what we economists have to, uh, to say about this thing. If you think about the last two centuries, our social construct, as organization of our society was built on two pillars. The first pillar was creation of value and the idea that consumers and, and corporations would pursue their self-interest. That was Adam Smith's invisible ant. 
But then, of course, you, you know, the markets have failures. Uh, Tito explained that very well. And of course, we have to correct market failures, and that's what the state is about, to correct for externalities like pollution. You explain internalities internality better than I could, but you know, try, you know, it might be the case that savings are insufficient, uh, that we consume too much drugs or too much alcohol, and so on and so forth. We have to correct for market power. Um, and of course, antitrust and regulation of natural monopolies is about that. We have to ensure that asymmetries of information do not create too much damage. Um, that's why we have consumer protection. That's why we have regulation of financial intermediaries. And of course, one of the biggest market failures as well is inequality and breakdown of solidarity about health, because this year, of course, uh, festival is dedicated to health. The fact that there is no reason why in a market economy you will have the right distribution of income or whether people will get the right health insurance. And the idea of, um, of this construction with, on those two pillars, basically, uh, the market which ensures efficiency, but at the same time you want the state to correct market failure, is that you give the right incentive uh, to economic agents to pursue the common good. And there is a complementarity between market and the state. Now, um, there's a third pillar, of course, because the state itself fails. So there are lots of uh, state failures as well. Um, and, and basically, social risk, did I skip a slide? No. Uh, there's a third pillar, which is a socially responsible investment. And it's a very democratic, decentralized approach, um, which builds on individual social responsibility, the fact that we are willing to, uh, to lose a little bit of income in, the, in order to pursue good causes. So as consumer, we are going to consume fair trade products. As investors, we may invest in green funds or social responsible investments. We may actually forego some of the salary to work for an NGO because we are proud to work for an NGO. And same thing for the firms, and we'll have to discuss that in more detail, where you know, the firms are socially responsible if they care about employees, about the environment, ethics, the community, and even the investors themselves. Now, if there's a long tradition of, all, of both, actually, uh, you know, the Quakers actually refused to trade in weapons, weapons and slavery, or, you know, in the 19th century, in many countries, Christian employers actually provided a number of public goods for their workers. Now, the big question we are going to ask is responsibility, responsible behavior at odds with our natural consequence of market economies. And my answer is, it's just a natural consequence of market economies. Somehow, socially responsible behavior, as I said, is linked with government failure of some kind. Um, it may be the case that the government is captured by lobbies. It may be the case that the government panders to the electorate because the government you know, they want to be elected or reelected, and therefore is not going to do the right thing if the electorate doesn't have the right information. Um, it may be the case, of course, that there are multiple jurisdictions we have 200 countries in the world, at least, and that means that you know, one country cannot do everything. You cannot control what's going on abroad, and that's very important, of course, as we see for climate change or for fiscal harmonization or child labor or many other things. And finally, the state cannot control everything. You know, minor nuisances, for example, or respect to others um, must actually uh, be disciplined through social norm. You cannot have you cannot have a policeman, a policeman behind each of us all the time. Now, so the first part of my talk is going to be about corporate social responsibility. And we are going to start defining corporate social responsibility because it's a catch-all phrase. Um, very different concept. Um, and the thing we are going to ask is, is this a sacrifice of profit? Or is there a business case for corporate social responsibility? And I'm going to go through three visions, um, which I developed with Roland Benabou, as you said. And I will talk more interestingly, maybe, about challenges for CSR. So the first vision is win-win, OK? Allora, prima di tutto eh, deve esserci una situazione win-win, dove tutte, tutte le parti ci guadagnano, ovviamente. Ma conoscete qualcuno eh, che vorrà sia disposto a perdere dei soldi non ha senso è pazzo io non conosco nessuno che eh, vorrebbe essere non so cattivo per poi perdere dei soldi 
story, which is often emphasized, for example, by sovereign wealth funds, is that actually you, you try to fight short-termism. Okay? Um, for example, you, you don't break uh, implicit contract with workers, so you, you know, if you can keep the workers because you momentarily have some trouble, but they will be useful in the future, then you, you might actually incur a little bit loss of money in order to keep your implicit contract with your employees. You don't take risk um, with environmental matters because there might be a big, big catastrophe, an oil spill or something like that, and then there will be big liabilities or, or lawsuits. Uh, you provide clawbacks for executive compensation uh, with the idea that uh, your managers are going to take a longer term perspective. Now, is it, why is it linked with corporate social responsibility? Uh, it's linked because very often those short-term behaviors also create some damage. Some damage for the environment, like in an oil spill, for example, or it could be a damage on the workers who lose their job. It could be a damage for the taxpayer when a bank is bailed out by government. It can be various things. But of course there, there is uh, some, some case for activism. So if you are a socially responsible fund, for example, you might want to intervene in the management of the company so as to make it longer term. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, and actually it's what economists have always called intertemporal profit maximization, which is uh, the right concept of profit is not a short-term profit, it's a long-term profit. It's an old concept in economics. Of course, in reality, we see a lot of short-term behavior which are driven in part by the wrong incentives. But basically, this concept of win-win, you can think of it as being an intertemporal profit maximization. Second vision of corporate social responsibility, the firm is a channel for the expression of citizen value. So the idea is that as a stakeholder, you might be willing to sacrifice some money or some profit in order to further social goals. But you cannot do it yourself. I mean, you can do it yourself through charity. But you also would like the firms who you deal with to be nicer. And you are willing to pay at least a bit for that. So for example, as, as an investor, you are willing to lose a little bit of your yield on your investment if you invest in socially responsible firms. As an employee, you are willing to work for an NGO even if your salary is a bit lower. Or as a customer, you are willing to basically pay a little bit more for your co coffee if your coffee is fair trade. Um, again, this important thing to notice is that it's completely consistent with profit maximization because what happens in practice is that actually the firms have you pay for it. So you are going to pay your coffee a little bit more, right? It's going to be a bit more expensive. And in a sense, what they do is that they do charity on your behalf. The firms do charity on your behalf. They can hire workers at a lower wage. They can basically raise funds at a lower cost of capital. And they can sell their product at a little bit more expensive. And there's evidence which is consistent with that, like higher return on sin stocks. And especially the greater prevalence of CSR among firms which are large, highly visible, they produce final goods, so they actually interact with customers, they're scrutinized by NGOs, and are profitable. So that's all consistent with this view. And also that's consistent, of course, with the view of greenwashing. And one of the problems with CSR is that sometimes it becomes greenwashing, and of course we want firms to be serious about their behavior, uh, their pro-social behavior. So the third, the, third, uh, the third question today is, uh, I'm still learning, <laughs> I'm still learning how to use this. Uh, the third possibility is corporate philanthropy. So there, it's not profit maximization anymore, it's basically you sacrifice profit to do, to do good. Um, and that has drawn criticism from economists on the right, si right side and the left side. So Milton Friedman, actually said you should not do charity with others' money, you should do charity with your own money. And Robert Reich actually was very upset that uh, actually charity would be done by private institution as opposed to the state. Um, sometimes it may be hard to tell apart from Vision 2, which is delegated philanthropy, because of course, if you do charity, you also uh, get a better public image, and of course, you may also cash in a little bit on that. So let me talk about the challenges with those views. The first challenge, which is obvious, is free riding, which is we're all willing to help with the environment and to 
help with development and so on, but the question is, you know, if we pay 10% more for our coffee, that's fine, but if we pay twice as much, are we still going to buy this fair trade coffee? Um, so free riding is there, and it may become bigger, for example, in, the, in, in terms of investment, when more people get involved in socially responsible investment. Right now, given that socially responsible investment is still small, you just can pick the firms which are greener, for example, and you don't lose on return, by and large. You don't lose very much. But you know, as this thing becomes more, more prevalent, then that may change over time. But this is not what I want to emphasize. I want to emphasize, emphasize the information prime. One obvious thing with information is measurement. You know, how do you uh, measure the quality of, uh, of social responsibility of a firm? Um, so you need rating agencies, and now we have a number of rating agencies which do exactly that. But then there is a question of how they report their finding. So there is the issue of aggregation. So for example, imagine that I'm an electricity company, I produce with coal, it's cheap, but it pollutes a lot. It emits SO2, CO2, NOx, and so on. And I compensate, I keep workers, and I, I build a school for the community and all those things. So how do, you, how do you aggregate those different dimensions? Oh, we see lots of companies which engage in fair trade and this, at the same time evade corporate tax in a legal way, but they, they use loopholes to evade the corporate tax. Do you want to use a relative performance evaluation or an absolute performance? So for example, you might, you might be a coal producer, but at the same time you try to you put, you put some efforts in in order to improve and, and pollute less. So do you want a relative evaluation or uh, an absolute evaluation? And then there is a question of criteria, which is very important because Corporate social responsibility, as I said, is a decentralized solution and basically inherits all the costs and benefits of the democratic process. It's a very democratic approach. It's not a centralized state-driven approach. So the rating agencies and the CEOs themselves are likely to pander to their customers' beliefs so, uh, and also to politicians who, who have regulatory power. So they're going to exploit cognitive bias. In, in this book that Tito mentioned, The Economics of the Common Good, for the Common Good, um, I tried to show how you know, our views about economics and science in general are distorted by motivated beliefs and also by the confusion between you know, the ignorance of uh, the neglect of indirect effects. We just look at first impression, the direct effects. And there are many examples um, where you have to ask yourself, will the voters, in this case, as, uh, they will be the people who actually uh, behave responsibly. Uh, will they understand what is at stake? So Michael Kramer is at this, uh, at this festival, and he has developed this paper uh, with this well-known example of his. Imagine that an NGO confiscates ivory. And the question for the NGO is whether to sell the ivory or to basically destroy it. And most people will say, Oh, that's obvious. Morally, the NGO should destroy the ivory. However, it's not that obvious because, of course, if you sell the ivory first, you will have more income for your activities, but also um, you will reduce the price of ivory. And if you reduce the price of ivory, you will reduce the incentive of poachers to, to basically get more ivory. So it's a good. Now, they, there are counter arguments, of course, which is that if a respectable uh, if a respectable organization starts selling, organiza so start se start selling ivory, then that may be bad also in terms of image. That may mean that trading ivory is respectable. And I'm not, say I'm not giving the answer, but I'm saying, you know, it is a difficult, uh, difficult uh, issue. But if you could sell it secretly, then I'm quite sure it would be a good thing to sell it. <laughs> right? If nobody knew and you would just sell it on the market secretly, that would be a good thing because you'll get more money from the NGO and you'll reduce the price of ivory. And then you'll basically reduce poaching. But I could go, go on and on. I mean, for those of you who are interested in, the, in climate change, clean development mechanism look like a wonderful mechanism. And then when you start thinking about it, then that creates other primes. Because if you think about the indirect effects, they are not as good as the direct effect. You could say the same for un unemployment policies and for many other things. And of course, framing is very important. 
So for example, if you ask a question to people about offshoring, and you can frame it as helping poor, a poor country develop or as minimizing labor costs and firing people in the domestic country, you'll get very different answer if you do that. So this is a difficult issue, and our understanding is, of course, going to be one limit of, uh, of corporate social responsibility, or at least we need to, to train people so that they understand the issues. That brings me to the second topic of this uh, of this uh, speech, which is markets and morality. So in terms of markets and morality, um, as you all know, most economics spend their professional life analyzing market failures. And I'm not the only one, of course. I got the prize, Nobel Prize for regulation. But I think many economists, more generally, actually spend their life looking at when markets fail. And there are many, so, so many examples of that, that we have a lot of work to do, and there are jobs for all of us. But, but still, we see, it's fair to say, that we see markets as essential. And this is not new. I, you know, at the time where communism was so prevalent, among, so popular among intellectuals, I think economists, not all of them, actually resisted this view and said, watch out, you are going to create trouble. If you believe in a new man, you forget completely about incentives. And that is likely to lead to totalism uh, totalitarianism <laughs> uh, because of course you won't get what you expected and then you'll have to impose and then you'll start uh, creating primes with incentive creating primes with uh, purchasing power, creating primes with freedom, with the environment with etc, etc um, so it's fair to say that on the whole even so we spend our life talking about regulation and caveats, we are kind of pro-market. Um, and our societies, in a sense, are pro-market because almost every society now in the world, except North Korea, is a market economy by and large. But it's fair to say also that social scientists, part of civil societies and most regions, actually differ, have a different view of society. And a different view of economics, they will argue that uh, economists fail to draw a clear line between a, what has a price and what has a dignity, to use a count, or between the profane and the sacred, to use Durkheim's word. And, and they also argue that markets are a threat, a threat to social cohesion. Um, there are different views, sociologists, religions, uh, and philosophers as well. Philosophers have written many books. I, I, I just have two here on the screen, but there are many other books that you can read which are all very interesting. And they have similar titles. So, for example, Michael Sandel Books, which was a, a worldwide success, a very bestseller, is called What the Market Can Buy. And Deborah Satz's book, Deborah Satz is a philosopher at Stanford, Michael Sandel is at Harvard, has his book, which is very interesting on why some things should not be for sale. Um, very different views, by the way, but um, clearly this is a big topic for philosophers. And it should be a big topic for economists as well. So we need, we need to understand more uh, those objections and try to understand um, what may be wrong with economics and what may be right as well. So let me be a, bo a bit provocative and talk about the market for virtuous indignation, um, which is on both sides of the political spectrum, by the way. You see that on the right side, on the left side of the political spectrum, and the very negative sentiments in some countries toward economics. Um, with this view that um, we, don't, we economists don't take into account enough um, notious and re repugnant markets uh, and, complain, and they, they have complaints about economists' welt on Chaung. Uh, a vision of the world is not the right one. So a good example of that is Michael Sandel, and I'm going to quote for him. He will say the wide range of goods and services, including babies for adoption, surrogate motherhood, sexuality, drugs, military service, votes, and organ transplantations, are not to be commoditized through markets. No more than friendship, admission to elite universities, or Nobel prizes are to be bought, or genes or and other forms of life to be patented. So this, there's this view that markets, or at least a number of markets, are actually very bad, and economists fail to see that. 
I was also, and to be frank, and to be a bit upset when I saw the Laudato C, the, the encyclical um, uh, 2015 uh, uh, vision of climate change, which had a lot of good elements in it, but, but the Pope, and this is a sentence which I, I found very damaging, the environment cannot be safeguarded or promoted by market forces. When we know that for all pollutants, the way we actually succeeded in getting rid of pollution was either a tax or a market, but in any case a price, so a market approach, uh, an economic approach as it's called. So we know that all the successful uh, ways, uh, you know, fights against pollution actually were market oriented. So we have to be very careful for, with that. Um, there is a different uh, vision of the world uh, with respect to market clearing. Very often uh, people outside economics actually care more for rationing than for market clearing. So for allocation made by lotteries based on age or some kind of, speci some kind of attribute, non-elected boards or first-come, first-served basis, or lotteries. I mean, there was even a proposal last year in France of having a selection at university done, not, not on merit, but based on a lottery. Um, because, as you know, in France, everybody has a right to go to universities with lots of bad consequences in terms of selecting the right, pup the right students in the right, um, right fields and the right universities. Uh, and doing the selection in, in a very obnoxious way through failure. And basically, uh, one of the things that non-economists don't like, for example, is peak low pricing or surge pricing and so on and so forth. Um, there is also this vision that economists, um, economics is about markets and markets and are about laissez-faire. And of course, you know, there is nothing uh, th this is completely wrong. Of course, we don't believe that economics is about laissez-faire. We believe in markets, but we believe in the regulation of markets. And, you know, it's not, it's not the same as laissez-faire. There is a more serious issue about the equation between economists and selfish calculating individuals. Um, we emphasize that people react to incentives. People, I mean, firms, individuals, politicians, those can be financial incentives, career concerns, status concerns, and the like. So we see, we describe people as being basically machines reacting to, to incentives. And one criticism on which we need more research is that economics could be performative. So it might change your vision of the world, and it might create its own reality. It's true that we always consider trade-offs. We may be losing perspective in that way. Um, of course, we economists know, and again, this is a festival about, about health. We know it's very difficult to talk about economics in the health, in the healthcare matters, because immediately you're going to talk about choice. Any hospital, by the way, is making choice and has a value of life, an implicit value of life. You have to buy equipment, you have to put one more doctor here and one less doctor there. And in a sense, any time you make a decision, you always make a decision about the value of life. We ourselves, and of course we will never want to believe that, but we, make, we put a value of life on our children. You know, if we take our children to an exotic, an exotic holiday, or if we buy a car which is sturdy or not sturdy, a sports car versus a you know, very strong car, um, we, make, we make a choice on the value of our children. We, we don't want to admit that even to ourselves, not, of course not to others, but that, that's reality. But of course we know that in the realm of uh, life and uh, safety choices, it's very hard for an economist to talk about the value of life. Um, but it may be still that there's something wrong about us, that uh, actually we are more selfish than other people because we transform our vision of the world. We have learned from Adam Smith that actually selfishness can give you an, an harmonious uh, uh, society, you know, efficient society. Of course, given all the market failures I gave you, you know, we don't quite believe in it, but it's, it's an important thing. Another difference, I guess, between economists and others is a very strong emphasis on utilitarianism and consequentialism. Um, we emphasize consequences or 
potential consequences of acts in the tradition of Bentham and Mill. And we have pretty little appetite for deontology and duty-based approaches like Kant's, for example. I mean, there are things that shock us. I mean, you remember Kant's uh, liar example. I mean, the modern form is, is, you know, if a Nazi knocks at your door and you're hiding a Jewish child and the Nazi asks you whether you have a child at home, and a, a Jewish child, and, you know, Kant will say you shouldn't lie because you have this imperative of, of not lying. You should govern your life uh, through the absence of lie, for example. And, of course, that's not something that economists are, are comfortable with. We, we think in terms of consequences, and I'll come back to that. It's very important. But it's going to, of course, condition our willingness to envision trade-offs. So philosophers have been playing for decades with the trolley dilemma. There are many versions of that, uh, including medical versions. You know, does a doctor sacrifice one healthy person to get organs to save five other people? Or uh, the standard trolley dilemma, do you push someone in front of a trolley and that way you save five people down the road? I mean, as an economist, I must say, I, it's a no-brainer to me. If you are behind the veil of ignorance, you have you know, five times more chance to be one of those people who are going to be, to be killed than, than being the person who you are going to kill by, pushing, by being pushed, by pushing him or her under the trolley. Uh, but most people actually refuse this kind of trade-off. They refuse to answer this question or they say, I will never kill, some kind of deontological approach to it. But we have to face that, and actually have colleagues in Toulouse, who, psychologists, who work on the driverless car. So now when you face a situation where either you crash yourself in a wall or you kill five pedestrians, what do you do? Well, it's, it goes very fast, you just don't quite know what to do, and you make a choice, whatever it is. But in a few years, it will be a software and that will have been decided a long time in advance in a very cold environment. Do I sacrifice a driver or do I kill the five pedestrian? And you know, those psychologists, they start asking the question, you know, what is the attitude of people toward that? Do they want regulation? Do they want this and that? So we have to talk about those comparisons. We have to talk about how we deal with such things. But of course, we feel very at ease with, with doing this. Finally, let me talk about the economist uh, difficult communication. Um, and that's the difficulties are sometimes shared with other sciences. Today, in the age of populism, there is a particular distrust of experts. And of course, economists uh, can be blamed to, and are blamed, and sometimes, you know, for good reason, but still there is this wide distrust of experts. So if you are in any field which has actually a, some interaction with a wider audience like medicine or biotech or, or climate, climate science or economics, then you are in particular trouble. Another difficulty, of course, is that we are scientists, so we are researchers, and we always look at the pro and the con, you know, the argument and the counter-argument. And we, you know, in terms of the media communication, we are not very at ease because, you know, the, both uh, the audience, the wide audience, and also the politician, they want a clear answer. Here is the answer. And of course, you as a scientist, you say, look, I think this is the right policy, but I have to warn you, there might be some side effect there. And this doesn't fly. I mean, in a sense, you know, you're more successful when you're on TV if you have a very clear message and you have no doubt about this message. Now, I still think we should have messages because I, you, we have to play some role in public policy. So you, we must say, you know, given our knowledge at this point of time, here is what I think is the best solution. But, you know, as scientists, we also must have our doubts. Um, but also there are things which are specific to economics, I would say, or uh, human and social sciences. One of them is that we are bearer of bad news. And, of course, people like to shoot the messenger. Um, in a sense, economic analysis is going to expose our deep values. Our deep values, because we and everybody in society would like to think we, are, we live in a better world. It's very reassuring in terms of our vision of, of society, so we want to, to think about 
uh, you, mankind, and we wa want to think that people are altruistic, they behave with empathy, and we want to believe in green growth, we want to believe that you know, the environmental problem is going to be solved without any cost, technological progress is going to, to, to come um, exogenously, or we want to think that uh, uh, the, you know, the increase in, in national debt, for example, is not going to jeopardize a social welfare state. So we want to basically believe in a bright future, and of course that's going to uh, conflict with some of the evidence. And when, when economists say, you know, we are not doing enough for climate change, basically everybody else uh, is upset. Um, so most people are upset that, you know, because uh, you say, no, you have to have a price of carbon which is not five euros per ton, it should be 50 euros, and then everybody's upset. Um, in the moral domain, um, it, it's also very important to um, say, well, we need incentives. And of course, when economists say we need incentives to solve some problems like climate change or others, we, or when we say politicians need, need incentives as well, or better incentives, then uh, we are saying, in a sense, you know, they are not completely benevolent. We are not completely be benevolent. We all react to incentives. And of course, that's a vision of society, which is not uh, the vision of society we we'll, we'll like to have. Another difficulty for economists, of course, as I mentioned, is that we we see direct effects, we don't see the indirect effects. It's very important for policies like uh, labor market protection, of course, that's something Tito has worked a lot on, um, or rent control, or et cetera. We always see the direct beneficiary of the policy. We never see the indirect effect down the road. So people who won't find an apartment to rent in the future because there is a scarcity of apartments, uh, people won't find a job. They will only find short-term jobs. They will be unemployed because the firms are not creating permanent jobs anymore. So we economists are accused, actually, of lacking empathy for the direct beneficiary of the policy. But what we do is actually also trying to force ourselves about the indirect victims. It's very different from medicine, for example, where for most, for most things, except vaccination, which I understand is a big topic, <laughs> seeing in the street of Trento. Um, but you know, in, for, vac for most things, the direct and the indirect uh, uh, beneficiary or victim are the same person. But of course, there is another thing I want to emphasize, that the economists are not very good at predicting. And that's very important to understand. I think economists are much better at designing policies that are going to uh, reduce the risk of, of a sovereign crisis or a banking crisis than at predicting a sovereign crisis or banking crisis. Um, for various reasons, first, our theories are imperfect. Second reason is that often we don't have the data, good data to be able to predict, even if, when our theories are good. Uh, and the third reason is more specific to human and social sciences. So we have behaviors which are not fully rational. There is uh, uh, you know, individual behaviors that, that we are trying to understand what they are, but you know, they are not fully rational sometimes. But also you have self-fulfilling phenomena. So if you think about an asset bubble or a bank run or a sovereign run, it's going to be uh, subject to strategic uncertainty and therefore it's going to be hard to predict. So I think we ask too much from economists in terms of prediction and whether, what they are much better at is we trying to design policies which is going to reduce the risk of having such crises. It's not very different from being a doctor or being a seismologist. So if you ask your doctor, you know, you, am I at risk of heart attack? You know, the doctor will say you, okay, you are at risk and you should do this, this and that. But the doctor will be unable to predict whether you will have a heart attack in two days or in 20 years or ever. Uh, and same thing for a seismologist who won't be able to predict the date of the earthquake. So let me switch to modern economics and markets. So um, the question is why is that, that the trade between two consenting adults um, will be bad for society? And that's the basic question we have to ask. And that's at the heart of the philosophers and, and others' uh, criticism of economics. Uh, and the answer is 
One answer, the first answer, and simple answer is market failures. So the first, and I'm, I'm going back to Tito, we, we explained that very well, the first issue is externality. Just like there is pollution, if you think about, uh, for example, babies for adoption, a market for babies for adoption, there is a seller and a buyer, and, but there is a third party which is not part, who is not part of the transaction, that the baby herself or himself, who of course is going to suffer a big anxiety if that's not the right parent. Um, child labor, market for diamonds and civil wars, or market for votes. We know that such markets create a lot of anxieties and they have to be regulated. So it's just a market failure of some kind. Another type of anxiety is image anxiety. So if you think about dwarf tossing, there is, there is a very interesting case. So you toss, you know, for those of you who don't know dwarf tossing, I haven't seen the right movies or the right books. Uh, it's uh, this silly practice of taking a, a little person and trying to throw away the little person as fast as possible. Um, now, the, it's not dangerous. You know, the person has a helmet, has, has all kinds of things that make it non-dangerous. And there was a case like uh, a bit over 20 years ago in France, actually, which went to the Supreme Court in which a little person, uh, there, was, there was some event like that which was planned and was forbidden by the authorities, local authorities, and the little person actually sued. This is my job. Why do you prevent me uh, from, from doing that? And then, in the end, the, the upper court says, no, you should not do that. Now, the question is why, because there are people who are willing to pay to see that, and the little person actually was very willing, actually sued for the right to do his job. And I think the court reasoned in the right way, which is, it's not about this particular little person, it's about the other little person whose image will be degraded by this. I mean, we don't have to understand why actually people enjoy that. That's a, that's a different matter. But even if you, if you take it for granted that people enjoy that, um, the idea is that there is an anxiety on, on third parties, which are the other dwarfs. And same thing for prostitution. You know, one of the arguments against prostitution, and again, you could say it's between consulting, consenting adults, is that you know, it, throws, it throws a bad image, especially on, on women, um, and that's something which, uh, which is bad. I'll, I'll come back to that, but that's very important. Okay. So we also know that the markets are imperfect, so there's market power. So, you know, in terms of repugnant market application, there can, there can be price gouging. So, for example, if there is some kind of, you know, uh, Hurricane Katrina coming, uh, there is some kind of flood coming, and then the taxi driver asks you for $5,000 to take you out of the city. We feel a bit uncomfortable. We feel uncomfortable about contracts written under duress, too. And there are all kinds of asymmetric information things that we, we want to, to discuss. Um, so in, in the case of organ donation, so Michael Kramer is in Trento, um, and you have probably listened to him, um, there's this issue that uh, people may not understand um, the long-term consequences of their, of their act, and then if they are kind of hyperbolic, so if they tend to privilege the presence too much relative to the future, then they might actually for a few hundred dollars uh, give their kidney and then uh, suffer the consequences. Of course, you have to inform people about the consequences of those acts. Um, something which is not always well understood by non-economists is the issue of signaling and the value of information. Um, so just to come back to Michael Sandel's uh, thing, of course, you cannot pay for friendship because if you pay for friendship, you don't know whether it's friendship after all, right? There is no way. If you pay for the Nobel Prize and the certification is not that great, and so on and so forth. If you pay for the right to enter Harvard, of course, what is the value of a diploma of Harvard? I mean, it signals that your parents are are uh, rich, so it doesn't sing, signal that you're very able. So asymmetric information means that it's very difficult to market for certain things. And of course, there is the issue of an inequality, which is of course very big, which has consequences, and that's another case where market fail easily. So for example, one of the big danger in the near future, and we'll need regulation, some type of regulation we already have actually, uh, to fight reselection in the market for health insurance. Because with 
digital economy, basically Facebook and Google know everything about you and they know a lot about your health, but with genetics it's going to be even worse. So, so if you are going to be in good health, you, you get a very low price for insurance, wonderful. Uh, but of course the cost of that is that those who will be in bad health they will not get any insurance, or at least not insurance, at a reasonable price. There's inequality, and inequality is of course important, with very different attitudes. I mean, sometimes we call it tolerate inequality, better hospital, better schools, safer car for the rich, but sometimes we don't want it. So for example, if we want to allocate water when it's limited, or a lifeboat on the Titanic, we we don't think that people should be paying for it, even if, um, actually, because there will be inequality. Um, actually, it's an interesting question whether we will tolerate people to pay for a lifeboat in advance. You know, when the Titanic leaves England, uh, whether you accept people paying for it, there's scarcity of uh, lifeboats, and people paying for those lifeboats um, even if they had the same income on the same wealth. That would be an interesting question. But in any case, uh, you know, the, the aversion to inequality and the fact that we don't want to see where we live in an unequal society actually pushes us to actually also have some attitude towards those repugnant markets. So a typical policy towards prostitution is actually to push it aside so that we don't see it, right? Um, you know, and organ sales, of course, raises this issue. I mean, there are other reasons for why we, um, we might not want organ sales. But one reason for why we don't want organ sales is actually not such a good reason, which is that we don't want to see how unequal our societies is, are. Because, of course, people who sell their organs, their kidneys, or the pe people who prostitute themselves, they tend to be poor people, destitute people. And you say, how can... How come you can sell your kidney for $300? You know, it sounds, it shows a lot about our society and that's something we don't want to see. Market failures, I think uh, Tito explained very well. Internalities, which is a failure of pursuing one's self-interest, of course, it's uh, motivation for a lot of policies, uh, public policies, so cooling off periods, so you, for some purchases, you have one week to wait. You can basically uh, cancel the purchase. All kind of policies with respect to drugs, addiction, gambling, or, or forcing you to save. Basically, the idea is that you, we all have self-control problems, and we emphasize uh, the present much more than the future, even in our own interests. So it, you are forced actually to save more, or to drink less, or to gamble less, and so on. And of course, there are voluntary repugnant market applications like voluntary slavery. So just ask you, have you ever asked yourself, are you against voluntary slavery? So if I ask you to raise your hands, I'm not, you know, are you in favor of voluntary slavery? I'm quite sure that I'm not going to see a single hand in the room. But you have to ask yourself why. It's actually interesting to know why. We are all against involuntary slavery. You know? But what about voluntary slavery? You know, someone becomes a slave for the other, and it's a contract. It has been thought about, and the, the terms are clear. It's entirely voluntary. Those are consult, consenting, consenting adults. And I think the answer is basically this internality, that people might want for a short-term gain actually to sell their long-term welfare. But, you know, we have to think about why actually we are against it. And I think a little bit is true of the same is true for organ sales. And sometimes we have a mixture of internalities and externalities. So if you think about doping in sports, for example, then if you, 